Hey everyone. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys about trying to give you guys a brief overview of everything that we did during the three week summer school throughout August. You like, you already know everything, but yeah, you can add as, as we go. Um, so yeah, so I'll start with who was there. I'll talk about, um, so the projects boil down to five or six overall groups. Um, I'll talk about the schedule of events per day, um, the reading group. So there were, yeah, I'll get more into what everything is, but the reading groups, and then I'll try to summarize the key points from all of the lectures, and that will be the bulk of this discussion. And then all of this information can also be found on the CV for Ecology website here. All right, so the instructor admin team was Sarah and Pietro, were the co PIs. Um, Eli, Jason, Benny, and Bjorn were the instructors. Uh, Tarun, Justin, and myself were TAs. Um, Tarun's also at Caltech, and Justin, we hope to get at Caltech. Uh, and then Caroline and Zenia uh, provided the admin support. Everyone knows Caroline. Zenia is with the ResNIC. The ResNIC is. <laughs> Yeah, so it was all funded by the rest. And then we had 18 students. Here's all their pictures. Also, all of them are posted on the website. Um, their projects boiled down into six categories. So we had re ID projects with re identifying bare faces and I like trying to re ID Iberian lynxes. Um, we had classifications. So uh, we had a student working on identifying lemur sounds, whether lemur sounds were in a spectrogram or not. Um, we have another student identify bumblebees, um, another look at urban wildlife and try to say, okay, was there urban wildlife in this photo or was there not? Um, weather. So we tried to, we had a student who was trying to detect snow versus rain um, versus no weather at all. Uh, we had a student try to detect ant sizing. So um, see if an ant was one centimeter long or two centimeters long or however large they were. Um, and then we had another student try to identify beaked whale species from their click sounds um, in spectrograms. Uh, another category was regression. So we had a student try to identify wind speed through um, like vi in videos as wind was passing through trees, which is kind of a different problem. Um, we had one category of clustering. So, um, no, the Iberian lynx is part of reality, but uh, species richness. So, we had one student, um, instead of trying to identify the species, particular species in images um, or a, a higher order family of species, they were trying to understand sort of the feature embedding in the image space. Um, to give, give a sense of how diverse the, the ecosystem was. Uh, we had a bunch of students working on segmentation. So um, I think all of these were remote sensing. They're using remote sensing data. Uh, one was trying to identify permafrost in the Arctic. One was looking at walrus blobs because um, they had a slight discoloration uh, from remote sensing images. And then one was working on um, above ground bioforest data, so trying to count trees or understand the biomass. Can I ask what yes. walrus? 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 Yeah. Uh, it's like a, you know, a seal. Do you know what a seal is? Like, uh, like a, yeah. Arctic. It's a lot of mammal that have very long teeth. Very long teeth. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the word in Spanish? Oh, yeah. Morsa. Uh, what's up? I would say something. Yeah, so the last group was detection. Um, so biospheres are um, areas areas in grasslands that they kind of look like, so it's like a bunch of trails circle this area. So it's, it's areas where there are a lot of uh, animals traverse. Uh, and it could be around an old watering hole, or it just indicates a lot of like uh, animal activity because there's a lot of indication. There's a lot of trails around, uh, around 
like there. No, like animal, like trail the animals are parked out. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, so for classification for lemurs and whales, you mentioned the spectrogram, and so it seems like it's more the sound. Yeah. So then was the summer school about like videos and images, and so that's why they're working on the sound, or is it not just computer vision? I would count audio as being in computer vision. If, I mean, like in general, it's vision is more than just, I think, site but we had them convert their audio to spectrograms spectrogram so that it would actually be a visual representation oh, yeah my understanding is that that's like the state of the art for how you solve audio bus computer problems is to convert them to okay. visuals and frequency representation oh. And do oh so you don't do like signal processing on computer i think you you do you do some of that as pre-processing sometimes but my understanding is that the schools are not well developed to work on like raw samples oh, okay okay um can we should we ask about each of these now or are we going to each of uh, we ask questions? We're not, so the plan, the structure of this is not to dig into each of these, but if you want to dig into each of these, you can go to the website um, or you can just at, like tweet at or I Slack see. or email. Can I ask a couple of quick ones? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So for uh, one with, this, with these tracks, were you just trying to detect track versus no track or actually follow the tracks. It's like that. if uh so Is it's because it like it's all it's all remote. It's all remote. So you have this like five by five vinyl uh swap and you're trying to see like this is what generally I passed it. It's like like trails surrounding and all of the black kinds of trails. And then this is just like a grassland area. So you're trying to detect this kind of pattern. But yeah. like as a whole, or do you try to follow it? As a whole. Oh, let's see. Mm -hmm. And okay, and for the for the re-identification, were there like supervised data sets or is this? Uh, is this an they were set? they were supervised. I see. Did it work well? Uh they struggled, they threw a lot of attempts at it. Uh and I know that the Iberian Lynx, uh, here, here, I know that the Iberian Lynx uh, data set was particularly difficult. Uh, and the bears, I think she got it to work. Like with, with a reasonable accuracy, just from a single frame or like from a whole video? She had, I think she had, I want to say she had single frames. Um, or if she didn't have single frames and she had video, she deconstructed the those videos into single frames and then use like one frame for training and one frame for testing kind of thing. Um, but, the, but the links didn't work because was it like a face thing? Or, or the know, links was a body and the uh, bear was a face. So right. she used mega detector on the bears, she used mega detector to crop the faces, so to identify the faces and then crop to that. And then uh she ran, she did re Oh, and one more general mega detector question: Is it is it? Uh, I, I haven't used it yet. Like uh, for for a new setting, new camera, like how good is the out of the box performance? Like does it require retraining? A lot, it, it seems pretty good. So she, both the bear person used it and the urban wildlife person used it to just crop to um, to the animal itself. Okay, that's what it's for. I like guess the, the whole design principle is so like this should be general across like different kinds of cameras, camera applications. But it was only detecting at a, at a coarse sure. semantic level, right? It's like animal, vehicle, person. Sure. And so it's been trained on bajillions of examples of those objects. And so it's, it's pretty good in new settings, I understand. Okay. Yeah, if you just want to know if there's an animal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. And one more question. How could, could the wind stuff work? <laughs> you like? Yeah, so that's, uh, so that's uh, Roni's project to see the PhD student in or the postdoc in uh in John Clavieri's group in the mechanical engineer aerospace. So she's at Catholic. Yeah. yeah. Oh okay. right. um, I think it works reasonably well. I, mostly people with like had kind of just got their prototypes working by the end. Mm -hmm. um, so they weren't to the point where they had like done a really rigorous evaluation against you know rigorously constructed baselines mm -hmm. but it does seem to work you know, reasonably well mm -hmm. but there's a lot of question about generalization like if you train on 
the species of tree attest on the species of tree versus training on one species of tree attest and another. And then uh, background issues, whether you're looking at the same sites or whether you're looking at different sites. Sure. So it's like same tree, same site was sort of working, but then from there. Yeah, and there, I don't think I don't think you got a chance to do evaluation on something more than that. Right. She also had, in order to calculate her data, she had like she created a data set of where she would be the wind force essentially, or she would have a wind force and know exactly what its mile per hour speed was, so that she, it could be like supervised or it could be practiced. Okay, so she had an anemometer, like a, in, in, in like site on site locations, she had she measured the wind speed. She also did wind tunnel experiments mm -hmm. where she could set the wind speed. And what was like the motivation? I mean, these the wind measurement things must be pretty cheap, no? Like I think they're expensive enough, uh, but I think the the motivation is being able to quickly uh, and cheaply do kind of mapping over an area. So you can imagine, like in the in the use case of like a, a wildfire, my understanding is the current state of the art is a fireman will go get a hand of the anemometer and do this. Oh, really? And then okay. wait, look at it, and then see that okay, oh, fire going that way. That makes sense. Uh, and so I think the, the vision here is that you could, for instance, uh, sample a hundred locations over the course of twenty minutes in a you know two kilometer area or something, and get vectors of each of those, and get a more kind of Oh, that's really cool. But I think that's yeah, probably two steps down the road. Um, I had a question about the bears. I was wondering, is it like, for instance, the whales where they were looking at the the end, like fin of the tail, and there was a specific pattern? And is there some something equivalent for the bears where the shape of the ears is very telling, or is it more like human face recognition? I think it was just. I think it was more like human face. She was basing it on human face recognition, so like distance from the eyes, length of the snout, um, kind of like. White whiskering to tell their age. Um, all, right. all right. So the schedule event. This this happened every every day for three weeks. We typically had either a lecture. Oh, in the morning we had a lecture by one of the instructors or TAs, an invited speaker. Um, and the invited speakers all came over Zoom, which I thought was cool for a sustainability related workshop because they didn't want to spend the carbon to fly here from all over the world. Um, then we had lunch. We had a really, really, really long lunch uh, in part to encourage discussion and collaboration in a more uh, colloquial setting. Uh, and then after lunch, uh, every other day, there was a reading group. So we split up into um, small groups and had all the students read two papers and present on them throughout the course of the workshop. Every two days, there's a new paper that everyone has to read. Or uh, it works differently across the group, so it kind of depended on what the group's leader wanted. But uh, and then in the after the rest of the afternoon was work time, and then after work time was dinner. And then I think typically after dinner, they went to their hotel and worked some more around the pool and stuff like that. So, very different. Uh, this is a list of invited speakers. They were all like great. You might recognize Oshin and Grant, um, but yeah, all, all awesome people. Uh, okay, yeah, and then the reading groups, they, there were four reading groups. Um, they were on time series and remote, remote sensing and spectral transforms. Most of the remote sensing people went into those. Um, data imbalance and the long tail. Most of their data sets were really unbalanced and had a really long tail. Um, so this is helpful for most of them. Um, there was another group on weeks of revision, unsupervised learning and fine tuning and um, training. And then there was a last reading group on bias, donation, and generalization. And there's a lot of overlap between what was discussed in all of these reading groups. So like there was one day when three of them all read the same paper, um, but yeah. But did you also exchange them between the- So we didn't exchange them between, but they, they so there, the instructions for each of the students was the person who would lead the discussion. So he read the paper and annotated it and would lead the discussion on that paper would also write like a paragraph about it um, to summarize it or take take away its key findings 
Um, and then all of those paragraphs were saved in a Google Doc that they all had access to. So at the end of the summer school, they all had this like very, very large annotated bibliography. Are you going to publish them? Like, or put it on medium? Can we have access to it? Uh, I'm sure you guys could have access to it. I don't know. If we would have to ask them. Yes. It seems very valuable. Yeah. Who picked the papers again? The students. Um, so we, the first day of the reading group was kind of like a brainstorming of here are the keywords that you should look for. Here's where like good sources to look at. We directed them mostly to uh, conferences like WACB and rather than CBPR because their content was a little bit more applied and we didn't want them getting kind of bogged in the weeds. Um, but they were with the juice from whatever. Which did it give me like bad papers being chosen. And that was like the question I wanted to make about like, this is why this is not a great, yeah. mm -hmm. and, you know, this evaluation is misleading or misleading to over. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is sort of maybe a reason to maybe not publish the whole, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> selective, selectively published, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is, uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to do my best to summarize three years of lectures in the rest of the time, so bear with me. But the first week we went over infrastructure, data, cleaning, and the command line. Um, so we did everything from command line tutorials, GitHub repos, uh, having them understand SSH, uh, discussing common machine learning terms, setting up cloud environments, um, getting them used to like whatever environment they're going to use, whether that was VS Code or the terminal at Sublime or everything in the Jupyter notebook running online. So was this like a, what was mixed, uh, like the crowd like the students? So they were non-CS people? Or? Yeah, so we wanted them, most of them had had our experience before. Um, and we wanted them to be up to speed on Python. Um, and so we did this office hours throughout the summer leading up to it to help them um, get up to speed on Python. And I think some of them really engaged in that and took, to, took that to heart so that they were more ready to go when they got to the summer school and others use that more as a suggestion than a rule. Um, so I think next time we wanna really make sure that they know Python so that uh, it's not this constant, uh, like, uh, like sure. small little question. So Postman had never opened the command line for anything. Just say again? Postman had never opened the oh, command okay. line for anything. Oh, well, yeah. okay. Okay, so it's like really domain expert people. For yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we talk on screens. And then uh, screens. screens is like, have you ever used Tmux? No. So it's um, it's where you have a process running in a terminal and then you wanna say, okay, I want, I want this terminal to keep on running even if I shut my laptop or disconnect from the server. Um, so it's just a way to say, I want to keep this process running while I do something else or while I shut my computer. What did you say if I had used before Tmux? Tmux. It's a it's so a screen and Tmux are two different ways or two different things that do the same thing. Wait, this is for like SSH and running. You can, do it, you can do it on your laptop. You can, you can just use like the end symbol or something at the end. You, you can also do that. that. Yeah, but then it's it might be harder to connect. It. So on cloud instances, if you're running cloud instances and you do the end symbol and then you like shut down your computer or whatever. Um, it might be it might be difficult to inspect that process again if you don't name it. Um, so you'd have to use talk and then get the process ID and then inspect it that way. Um, but with a screen, you can just name it uh, and then or you have a screen. Okay. Uh, here were the common machine learning terms. I thought that was a really nice slide, so I included it on here, but yeah. <laughs> um, we also wanted to, for each of their tasks, give them sort of the first 
uh, deep learning library to use. Um, so classification tasks use ResNet architectures and then object detection, segmentation, and key points use uh, like RCNN, a unit, and Yolo V5 for detection. Yeah. What is unit for? Unit was used for segmentation. A lot of them just been segmentation. So the walruses, um, the Landsat mapping, the, uh, the Pi biospheres. I love it again. And keeps running. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I went over most of this. We taught them all, all of these command line related things. So, what are, what are your takeaways from these? Like, what's the, what are the biggest, you would say, bottlenecks or what do you, what do, you do differently? So, I think. We're actually going to talk about this more tomorrow, um, like formally, but I think that one of the bigger takeaways, at least from the infrastructure and command line week, was to really have them demonstrate their Python ability before reaching the summer school, uh, rather than just trusting that everyone will. Uh, so, like a minimal level, somehow enforced. <laughs> so that they can like, run a Python script on it. Okay. And then also another key takeaway, I don't know what, what to do about this, but uh, we had a lot of trouble with both cloud providers to get GPU instances. So um, one takeaway might be to coordinate with them sooner to get GPU instances. Another could be to, um, I know that Georgia and um, Yangsong are gonna be here and require a lot of compute. So if they have a cluster, we can ask them to use their cluster. Uh, but yeah, just understanding how to get GPU. So what what was the problem there? So turns out that Amazon and Azure both had like have silicon shortages. And that means that while the domain demand is going up for GPU usage, the supply is staying the same. So they it used to be that when you needed the GPU instance from either of them. Uh, they, it was kind of like a rubber stamp. They would just say, yeah, sure, go ahead. And they denied all of our requests. Um, and so we had to fight for, <laughs> for GPU usage. And then even then, so- Like to get it for free? No, for just for the summer school. So they, they gave us credits, they gave us oh, money. And we said, okay, great, we have this money, now we need GPUs. And they said, no. So it's uh, like they put paid customers ahead of Credit. Or something. I think that they put like frequently using customers oh. ahead or like, huge customers ahead. Um, but we needed the GPUs for such a short amount of time that at least with Azure, we agreed with them that we would only use them for a month. Um, so all of the GPU access terminates tomorrow for all of the students. Um, oh, and okay. from there, they're going to have to use really, really large GPUs. Yeah, I think in the beginning I had the same problem with AWS. Did you I just signed up for all of the different locations. Yes, that is just, a trick. Yeah, uh, I started. I found like I don't know what was it like Singapore, or Paris, or one was not not that frequented. Yeah, <laughs> we had we had contacts that both, so I just okay. harassed. Okay. Uh, but it was like a lesson. Yeah. yeah. I was surprised by that. The distinction between like having credits and being able to use them for GPU was pretty weird. It was also a little bit like in the introduction, it was we need these credits for a computer vision uh, a summer workshop. But there was no connection between computer vision and needing a GPU. Just the support uh, people who we were talking to, I think, didn't make that connection. Oh, yeah, they're very bad. <laughs> There's also this in the beginning they set you up with like this zero CPU yeah, or yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And then I asked them like to raise it to be able to rent one machine. And they were like, give us a good use case why you want more than zero right. CPUs. It's like, I don't know, yes, it's just to use it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to explain yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. All right. We also I highly recommend everyone from this lab. Uh, looking at Benny's like workspace setup example. So he 
created this GitHub page with an example classifier, and it's just a really clean introduction to like object oriented programming and using classes um, and structuring your code really cleanly. Uh, there's slides from these. Yay. Uh, and then we also talked about data prototyping. So um, we had a lecture on sort of pitfalls. So like if your if your folder structure is too deep, it might be difficult to understand all of the data that's there. Um, sometimes it's better to have everything in one flat folder just to see everything that's there. Um, the importance of removing sensitive data. So if a photo is of a rare species like an agrarian lynx, you don't want to have a GPS coordinate attached to it in case it's published and then some nefarious actor gets it and thinks, oh, I can hunt the agrarian lynx at that GPS coordinate. Uh, making it easy to remove bad data. So like if you have something in your training set that you want to remove, making that process easy. Um, being consistent in empty values. So we had some students have like nans and zeros and like, okay, you pick one or the other or to like make it negative to differentiate it, uh, just be consistent with how you, how you label it. Um, the instructor recommended having your entire data set be less than 10 gigs, probably for ease of like manipulating it. Um, that's probably harder with our data sets, but certainly we can like create a prototype data set and then work on that. And we pushed a lot of the students to start with that, especially while we were in the process of getting all the GPUs. Uh, and then we really harped on the, the importance of understanding their data. So know it front and back, know how to answer any questions about it. Uh, don't leave any, any mystery unsolved. Uh, and then we taught, taught them about data splitting. So in, in distribution versus out of distribution data, uh, understanding that out of distribution data typically always does worse than in distribution, no matter how many examples you have um, and how to measure the performance of each in and out. You said that understanding that out of distribution data, what? Typically does worse. So this, in That's this what? chart, the error is a lot higher for the out of distribution data than the in distribution data. So this worse. Oh, that's yeah. uh, the importance of splitting that in distribution data and out of distribution data. Um, and then also, yeah, I think this was the last picture of the first week. Uh, the reasons for domain shifts in the real world, since all of virtually all of their data was real world, real data and not synthetic data. Um, like understanding the differences in time, season. Uh, different camera types, different angles where the cameras were positioned, uh, different like even sub populations within those camera types. So if the camera was like in front of a, like in Pasadena in front of a street versus in Pasadena in front of a tree, those might detect different species. And then, yeah, this is an, an example, which I thought was cool. Uh, it's a camera and then wildfire plays through the area. And so this is a picture of the wildfire. Uh, this is a picture of what the, the camera train. survives. Yeah, the camera survives. Uh, and then, yeah, I think this is like either the same coyote or both coyotes, uh, but it, it looks very different after the wildfire. Uh, we taught them about common libraries. So PyTorch, NumPy, OpenCV, and Pillow. Matplotlib, Pandas, Image Magic, which is a command line tool, and FFmpeg, which is just for audio. Uh, I think one lecture, one invited speaker, Ben, uh, said, "Yeah, the first thing I do with every Python notebook or Python file that I make is I import Matlib, NumPy, uh, PyTorch, and Pandas, and usually I can do everything that I want with those." Okay, so in the second week, moving to the second week, uh, we worked on teaching them how to evaluate their data, talking to them about uh, performance of their models, and then 
understanding data augmentation and when to use it. Um, so Eli gave this lecture on evaluation metrics, talking about Hamming distance or discrete distances between things, continuous distances or mean absolute errors, and then IOU metrics. Um, yeah, Hamming distance would measure how often am I wrong. We also talked about PR or precision recall curves. Um, what what precision was, what recall was, um, how the area under the curve matters. And then oh, we talked about confusion matrices, letting them understand like how often their model is right, what when their model is wrong, what are the misclassifications. Uh, I think a lot of them use ended up using confusion matrices just because they're very, very easy to interpret of like, oh, if in in this, like a rabbit is typically confused with a bat or a moth. Why is that? Like, let me focus my um, data or my um, model to see what it's why it's doing that. Uh, we also taught them how to use TensorBoard. Um, some of them used models with others. So like TensorBoard, weights and biases, there's a lot of different ways to uh, measure performance over time. Um, so we taught them TensorBoard and then some of them weights and biases. Uh, but these are really nice to sort of checkpoint how training is going or how validation is going as it's, as it's running um, so that you can like kill the process if you already know that it's not worth your time to wait for it to finish. And then we talked talk to them about saving and loading checkpoints. So with each epoch, it's best to save your weights um, just so that if, it, if the process crashes or something happens, you can start off from where you last were. Uh, we also talked, so along with checkpoints, we talked about saving paths to images. So if, um, if your images, or if your performance is low and uh, you want to see which images did worse in your training set, you can visualize what those images were. Um, you can also, Anyway, yeah, so um, Sarah gave this this lecture and had this matrix of most confusing raccoon images, which was where it predicted that it was a raccoon with a really high confidence. So the model was really, really, really sure of something that was wrong. Um, and so it was useful to see, okay, all of these are taken during the day. Um, all of them have like like a light and a dark element, so a shadow in it. Uh, just trends that you can see visually. Maybe that you Are they see. all squirrels? No, there's squirrel, cat, lizard, bird. But most of them are squirrels. So it might be like the bushy tail or like just the fur element that it's confusing. Next, we talked about common pitfalls. So Benny gave this lecture. Um, he talked about class imbalances and how to correct for class imbalances. Um, so we talked about loss weighting, custom losses, and curriculum learning. Um, a couple students uh, used curriculum learning, which was cool to see in action. So they trained on instead of um, they yeah they specifically trained on positive examples before training on negative examples, so that their model wouldn't always predict negative, um, which was um, interesting to see in practice. Uh, and then domain adaptation. So um, adapting the features or adapting the inputs, you could adapt the inputs with like GANs or with uh, data augmentation. Um, tracing, tra training with noisy labels, so label smoothing or teacher-student teacher networks. Uh, and then training with few labels, so Self-supervised learning, unsupervised learning, clustering, um, that kind of approach. Yeah, and then we gave them a lecture on data augmentation, um, sort of to know when to use what kinds of data augmentations and when to not, and then what kinds of data augmentations were available. 
Um, so common ones are flipping, uh, used in a good way for classification, detection, segmentation, and remote sensing, but not shouldn't be used for like re-ID problems or audio. Um, and then what for re -ID? For re-ID, I, I imagine it's because like if like the if you're looking at a face, it expects your right eye and left eye to be, or no, that's not a good example, but like say it expects your right eye to be a certain distance from your like right uh, mouth sure. mark or something. And then if that's flipped, then it would say, okay, I can't use that feature anymore because that's technically the same person, but uh, I can't base, base my analysis on that. Let's do that. For like actual like, human face information, sometimes an iPhone looks like this. True. <laughs> that would just be another challenge. But yeah, for these, I mean, no one is using an iPhone at their camera. I'm not just using pre and flipped images. Imagine something like their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Selfie, yeah. Uh, and then for for random cropping or resizing of the image, it was. Um, it's good to know that you should transform your inputs and your labels. Um, and then also it's not good to use when you need a sense of scale. So for remote sensing images, if you had uh, like a whale uh, and you zo zoomed in on that, it might think that it's a fish or something like, like something that looks a lot smaller but just get you to the scale of their system. I think that transforms the label as well. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Um, and then we talked about cutting out parts of the image or parts of the audio or like masking parts of the audio um, or just introducing dropout in some of the images so that your the model can not fit or at least force course dropout. I think it's just for everything for what I mean, is there a difference between dropout and force dropout? So and so there's dropout that. in the model mm -hmm. itself where you like you say like high torch model, dropout, however much percentage, and that's yeah, yeah or the I think that's a, a percentage of your data. Um, either the it's either the neurons or a percentage of your data, whereas it's the, the connections. Okay. Okay, good to know. Uh, I think in this case, we're talking about um, like dropping out chunks of the image. Chunks of the image. Um, so if you have like. Is it different from masking part of the image? So. Okay. So I think, yeah, masking could be used, but in terms of time frequency masking, it was like with audio or with, yeah, so figure out data. It was like, it'd be like yeah. mass. mass. Why well, is it called? Force? Yeah. Oh, force. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Are we pronouncing that? <laughs> it's impossible. No, right. Same pronunciation. Oh, is it my pronunciation? Not force and force. Oh, no. <laughs> force. Maybe it's like yeah, 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 but. English is amazing. So. so that's course robot. Yeah. Or this is mass frequency masking. Of and course, then it's like 12 questions. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then we also talked about time shifting and noise mixing, which were specifically for audio. Yeah, so here's some examples. Uh, Here's like a salt and pepper, a Gaussian smoothing, cutouts or like dropout, dropping out in terms of like adding noise to the image, um, mixing in terms of like if you have two sounds and you mix them together. So with the lemur project, she had some, she didn't have any lemur calls in the rain. But she had rain, she had lemur calls, so she mixed them together um, to make sure that her model could still identify lemurs in the rain. So that changed the flipping. I mean, I knew nothing about the physics of it, but 
really change the propagation of the sound, like the fact that it's in a wet or like rainy environment, and does it change the signal? Uh, I imagine that it amplifies. So like when you add two signals together, it just moves. Like you have like I mean, the sense is like with the sound, like in real life, you not know, just like adding two sounds on top of each other, but with like the sound maybe echo on the different properties, or like it changes the actual like perception of it. I'm sure that's true to some extent. Yeah, it is definitely not perfect. It, that, that's the that's the limitation of just adding two sounds together. Yeah, if you you don't have these like room acoustics or things like that, but it is a lot more reasonable than when we mix two images together. Uh, mm -hmm. Because sound actually is transparent like that, where mm -hmm. you have, if I'm talking and you're talking, the net effect is that we're both talking, mm -hmm. as opposed to like, these like image mix up things like they show below, where it really is kind of a nonsense image, mm -hmm. but we still find it very useful in practice. Right? Mm -hmm. What is it useful for? It's like a regularization technique. Oh. So that one is, um, the idea is you, you know, take two images in your batch and you take a random mixing coefficient between them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called mix up. At CBPR, there was an interesting like workshop paper where uh, they're trying to identify hotel rooms or hotels from hotel rooms that were used for human trafficking, mm -hmm. and they had to uh, cut out the victim. Um, so if the victim took up like half of the image, they would just mirror the other mm -hmm. half of the image, um, which is like not exactly mix up, but it's like. Just an, like, an interesting mirroring technique that augments the image. And then adding the weather, um, which was cool, especially for the girl who was dealing with weather. Which driver is that? Uh, it was all from PyTorch. Um, and he used Al Alumentations, but then he also made a collab demo and put it on GitHub. <laughs> All right, so the final week, we talked about ablations, um, improving efficiency of the model, and deploying the model. Um, so Eli also gave this lecture, uh, what ablations are, like bare comparisons between two methods, or two, yeah, between two methods. So if you want to compare method A to method B, you only want to change one thing between the two of them, um, and then do that incrementally. Uh, so common terms to ablate were loss function, and processing, um, training data sources, um, amount of pre-training, and then um, like metrics. So if you have, um, if you also wanna make sure with ablation studies that you come up with an average. So if you have method A, you run it three times, and you have method B and you also run it three times. And in this case, method A always beats method B. But you can also have method A, which does okay the first time, does really well the second time, and then does worse the third time. And then method B, which sometimes does better than method A, but not always. So it's hard to compare these two methods given that their performance is kind of all over. Did you make them compete confidence intervals on the performance metric? Uh, some of them did. We didn't make them. Can you make an example of writing the same method several times, given different results? I mean, oh, you'll, you'll have to change something. Right? Like here, here, and here. Not necessarily. So like there's randomness in the like the order of the training data in the computation process. So if it's like if if your if your method finds one local minimum one time and then a different local minimum the other time, and the different local minimum is further away from the global minimum. Uh, yeah. So you change the random So if you train on gigantic data sets, it's usually pretty stable. So these people often are training on pretty small data sets. So you can really, you can jump from overfitting one thing to overfitting a different thing on a bunch of runs. But if you don't change parameters and you fix the seed, it should be reproducible for one thing to the next. I think that's true in principle, but as my understanding in practice, it's very difficult to actually get that to happen. Like with PyTorch or whatever, you have to set like three or four. Yeah, you need to set like four by three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's more trying to communicate to them that like just because you ran once and got this number does not mean that that number is a stable estimate mm -hmm. of the quantity you're interested in. Yeah, yeah. My question was like, isn't that unstable? Like having those results 
I mean, I don't know. So it's real or not? Like, is that twenty percent of the rest? That's so it's like it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Or you'd need to like call out. You need to do all, like these um, uh, assumptions, or you need to set all these things. True. So this this toy example is meant to be a bad example. Like this this is a bad case where like, you run it again, you get a different answer. Right? It's very effective at conveying the concept visually. Yeah. You do a lot of colored boxes. <laughs> I like that you used colorblind blind for me. Those are the edges like the default palette, so that I think some engineer at Google. Take some credit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the importance of running it multiple times, um, increasing the size of the validation set, improving the balance in the validation set, training for longer, uh, and adding regularization in order to compare them. Uh, okay, so next we talked about improving efficiency, um, reasons why. Uh, if you're running a model on a really, really large data set, you don't want it to take forever. Um, if others want to use their model on their data, they don't want it to take forever, or you don't want, in order for others to use it, you don't want the barrier of entry to be super high. Um, or if, if eventually you want to be able to run on hardware like in the wild, uh, which they all might want to do. Uh, so easy gains were increasing the batch size in PyTorch. Uh, so how many images can be processed all at the same time in parallel? Um, Playing with the input size. So, if you have really, really large images, um, the time, the, there's a, like more of a bottleneck to uh, transfer that to the GPU, even though really, really large images may mean a better accuracy uh, versus really small images that you're probably more able to process quickly. And then optimizing the number of workers. So, your, your computer has a number of CPUs who can all like have threads run in parallel. Um, so instead of only working on one CPU, you can work with people. Um, Why hiring uh, large images give better results? They, they can, um, just because there's more detail in the image. But I'm thinking facial recognition, the images, the input size is 112 pieces. Really small. Mm -hmm. You can distinguish between millions mm -hmm. faces. So, but say you had like a remote sensing, like satellite image. If it's really really fuzzy, um, a computer vision model might not be able to tell if that's like in Wyoming versus in Montana, or if it's like really fuzzy and it doesn't have distinct edges, um, it might not be able to distinguish things as easily. Whereas if it has a lot of edges. And has like a lot of contrast. In theory, it's like more pixelated. So it's typically mm -hmm. they're also centered and close. Yeah. yeah, it's like most of your yeah. images are things in one thing. Oh, all of the, the images are things. So, like, yeah, yeah. so imagine if you like animals, like small corner of the image. Yeah. Or imagine if you like, if you took a picture of you walking and then had to zoom in on the face, and your face was all fuzzy. <laughs> Uh, we also talked about optimizing hardware, so teaching everyone NVIDIA SMI and watch to see um, how much memory it was using, um, like where performance bottlenecks were specifically in transferring from the CPU to the GPU. And then having some sort of performance timer continuously go off to say how long something was taking or um, how long your process had been running. Um, but time is not a uh, method for counting to count the efficiency, right? You could, you could have it multiple processes. It depends. Interrupting. It depends on what, what you want. So if you want immediate results, time is really a crucial measurement. Um, but if you want, like, if you don't care about how long uh, it takes to run. No, but I mean, you could have. I mean, the time is misleading 
because you would have other processes in the computer or the EPU interfering. I see what like like multiple processes running at once and then all all giving different times or no. you run your experiment. Yeah. And you the instructions for your experiment mm -hmm. are not uh, process sequence. Yeah. yeah. Because there may be other processes right, in right. your system right. executing at the same time. Mm -hmm. So fine. you'll be measuring all of the processes. Right. But in that's fine. So long, like depending, on, it's depending on what you want to measure, right? So if you want to measure each individual process, that's one like granularity. More likely is you want to measure how long training took or how long validation took. So like really like high level. Yeah, that's like you want to know like how long do we need to wait for this to like be done, as opposed to like is my code really efficient? Okay. Yeah. Can you show them GPU? So, so, yeah. uh, what did you ask? TQGM, the Python, the Python library that shows oh. you progress bar. Uh, yeah, we talked about usually the faster it is, the less, uh, like the less higher score is and then the slower like the more time that you take training typically the higher the score is uh but you want to reach the sweet, sweet spot where you cut off sort of where it plateaus or where you can say okay it's performing good enough let me just blow that up again sure so this is um like the metric so how well it's doing um and then this is uh, time. So the more the more time you have that's for inference or training. Uh, it looks like it's for inference because it's going to be So if your inference takes longer, then you have a better performance. Well, I think it's, it's both level and bigger. Yeah. So the more you, Model the more you, design, so it's the more you train, like the longer you train for, the more time you're giving the model to understand the data. So the more like it can. Doesn't make much sense if it's the inference time, right? So what do you mean, uh, milliseconds for image? Can you? Is this something you can fix? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's pretty much. Yeah, it's pretty much. No, I, don't I think I shared a good view here. Like yeah, if, each, if each color is one model, then what creates the different points on the line? Yeah, I guess is the question. So it's not like you're changing the model size. It could be checkpoints. Uh, is, is it because you vary the batch size? Yeah, but the batch size shouldn't change. Yeah. You are no, you are all of these predicting. all of these are run on a B100 GPU with batch size one. So the batch size is changing. I imagine I imagine so Justin made this graph, but I imagine what he did is just took each checkpoint and measured its performance. But why a checkpoint should take longer than another checkpoint? The run inference. Is it how many epochs it has been trained? So yeah, so checkpoints are usually saved at every day. So I mean, in the sense, like how many time was allocated for training? So how many epochs would turn okay, out? How, how long? And then you divide by the number of images. Maybe? Yeah, then that's training. Okay, so it's like training, training time. Or, yeah. It's what you said earlier that with the tensor board, like right. how efficient, like how the performance you need to be and how um, you if it's worth it for you to wait more time right. to get that for the one person exactly. yeah. that's, that's a bit of 
I, that, that's consistent with this graph. I'm not sure if that's what this would be a good way to present that information, I guess. And so, like, if you wanted to show like performance versus the amount of training, you could just show that directly. Yeah, but it's like the amount of training is not like speaking to you. Maybe like depending on the the scale of your data set or anything, you want to have a rough estimate of how much do we need to invest time wise to have like the time per images versus the number of epochs, which might not be very clear how many days or how many hours. Yeah, it's, it just it strikes me as not an unusual way to discuss efficiency. I, I didn't attend this lecture, so this is why I don't know the answer. Uh, but it seems like a reasonable analysis of what's going on here. Yeah. But yeah, comparing the strengths, that's very important. But also, there's like GitHub here, so I'm just going to dig into that more there. Uh, we, yeah, so we suggested for each of their tasks, like image classification, object detection, and segmentation um, architectures to start with that were reasonably efficient. Uh, and then we also, this is a cool part of the lecture, you talked about um, more advanced methods of how to gain uh, or like lose time. So half and mixed point precision. Um, so having a number take fewer bits um, that I think might otherwise need to. And then quantization, pruning, and knowledge distillation. It didn't entirely grasp all of those, but they're in his lecture in the GitHub repo. So all the lecture lectures are on the repo? Uh, most of them with code, or all of them with code are on the repo, and then otherwise they're in uh, Google Drive. There's a YouTube channel. Yeah, so all the lectures are recorded. Um, and who? Justin. The fish. Yeah. Yeah, so there's lectures. There's most of the invited speakers. But I mean, you have follow up. Yeah, and also, like, the slides, my slides here are not something I want to get to. Did any of the participants and Ended up, you know, doing. Um, I don't. I think maybe Remy tried uh, mixed point precision, uh, but I don't know. I think it makes sense. Maybe a later later stage when you like you were having your mom. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, would have been cool to yeah. think of where we're already at. Yeah. Yeah. Should do the fun is ready. And then lastly, we talked about what it was like to deploy a model. And um, so we talked about, you know, publishing the paper, publishing the code, publishing the environment. So like things that get up in yeah, publishing the paper, publishing the code, understanding, or yeah, publishing the data and then publishing the environment. So things like archive, GitHub, various data set sources like Caltech, Cackle, Lila VC is one specifically geared towards the environment. So that's useful to them. And then um, environments, environment publishers like Hugging Face and Docker. What are those publishers? Yeah, what do, can you publish them? For example, with, with accounts. So you could publish a data set. Okay. Yeah. So it's like papers go to archive, code goes to GitHub. Kaggle, all of these will take like data sets, and then plugging face and Docker are places where you can publish your whole environment. So if you want to say, use my computer and everything that I came with. Can you go back two slides? Yeah. So where do you start? Where, what's the starting point? I think it's here. Um, so first you create or you collect your data, you create your model, and then yeah, keep on creating your model. You plan to release it. I think it's from Microsoft. So oh, yeah. <laughs> their their ML ops people know this well. Uh, but yeah, I think generally it's create your data set. Generate your model. Um, or here I think we'll take a second. 
it's yeah, really it's iterative. Yeah. It's the gist of all of us. Yes, yeah, it's one of the stock um, structures you can use in Microsoft Word. You know, like you can Microsoft Word? 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 Word. 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 That was right? Okay. Oh, well, like the, the stuff here, yeah, like yeah. text editor, and so you know there are like some graphics that you can include, and that's one of the stock ones. Like oh. one key, like it's useful. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's yeah. It's also sure that it's iterative. Okay. Yeah. So this is my last slide. Conclusions. Um, so you can go to the website for more details. There's also the YouTube, which has. All the lectures, some of the invited parties, and all the presentations that the students felt comfortable sharing. Um, we're oh yeah, we're working on creating a more formal or detailed uh, like paper to release on archive or medium or wherever uh, that goes over this pedagogy, like how to teach computer vision to a non-clinical audience, um, and then. Also, if anyone here knows anyone who would be interested in this, I encourage them to apply next year. So you'll do that again for sure next year? I, I had a blast, so I think it would be fun. It would be fun if I was an instructor rather than a TA. Um, although, I mean, so being a TA, I got to go to all of the instructors. So the way that it works was people split up their subgroups, and the instructors had four to five people all working with them every day. Um, and so they got to really, really know those four to five projects deeply. And I, as a TA, would go to each of those rooms and sort of more broadly understand their issues and like what they were working on. Um, so it was, it was cool to be a TA because I got the experience of really knowing all of them and understanding their projects at a high level. But as an instructor, you could really like dig into each of their projects at a deeper level. Which was each student working on their own project that they had to apply with? Yeah. So there was no group work. So there's uh, I, I think the instructors met more, I mean, I never met with any of the students before the summer school, apart from the one, like office hour sessions for my mom, um, and the instructors met with each of the, their groups um, to go over visa issues or to talk about where they were. We wanted them to clean their data and get a good sense of their data before getting here so that once they got here, they could go off running with their models. Um, so just to like pull that uh, and sort of be more of the first responder to all the students. Well, is it a really competitive application? Like, all the agents that got it out of I think we, so we, we got, I want to say 50 or so applications. Uh, did you, as a, as a TA, did you have to produce any material? Like, I, I'm guessing instructors like to create their lecture slides, for instance? Yeah, so everyone created at least one lecture, including TAs, and then some of the instructors had more than one lecture and some of them had more than one lecture. Which one did you create? I did the cloud one. Uh, so, and then we all collectively put together all of these guides, which I want to eventually put on the, on like Peter's Labs website, of how to like create a VM, how to create a disk or a volume oh, and mount that on your That's very cool. How to like use screen. Mm -hmm. um, we have so much, so many tutorials that are like step by step. It sounds like a wiki could be a good place to run. Yeah. <laughs> good, but <laughs> I really want something in Google Apps. <laughs> I mean, we can make it. Yeah. That's great. Like, this is maybe a stupid question, but like for the future, for like people who have more like off the shelf problems, like how much, like, or how, how would you think would compare like to people, you know, go through all this training, like the ones that are really interested in using it mm -hmm. rather than developing models so to just do something that is, I mean, there are all these companies working for off the shelf, let's say segmentation, you just upload your data and you do sort of like a click 
drag and drop kind of thing. Right. And that probably already works good enough maybe for your stuff. I think that we were surprised actually to find that. So we, we figured that's why we gave them like, okay, you can use this PyTorch library and just plug it in and it should do reasonably well. And it didn't. Um, and so I think that a lot of the like in the wild data um, just required a lot more cleaning and a lot more understanding of the data in order to get it to a place where you could use the official methods. Um, and really understand what they were doing. And so the the point of this workshop was one, to introduce them to all the tools, but also to get them to understand. Like we had several people the first time they trained get 99% accuracy on their on their set. And it's like, okay, that number is probably wrong. Like let's dig into what you're actually measuring and why why it's why it's wrong. So if they had like 95%, yeah, or like if they had 95% negative samples and your model always predicted negative, like sure. it would do really well. Uh, so just teaching them that intuition and publishing at that level rather than using something and then publishing, I got 99% accuracy. And, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah. So like a really basic understanding how to use these as a tool. Yeah. Yeah. So like how to build this. Cool. Well, yeah. Um, Thank you so much, Suzanne. Yeah. That was like. Yeah. Really cool. Are you going to share with us this slide? Yeah. Uh, so I'll give them to Marcus and then Marcus can look them. And then I'll give them to the slide. Do you want to stop with one?